we're going to give a slightly uh, different version of the talk, the talk um, which I will give a copy to Andrew to, to circulate amongst everyone so they have the general formula uh, that I use. But I'm probably going to use a lot of case studies um, gathered from uh, my 16 years experience. But I normally start off uh, by explaining why, apart from the book, anyone should listen to a, a damn thing that I say. Um, so I normally start at the very beginning. Um, it was 1986. I'm joking. I'm not going to do that. Um, <laughs> um, I, uh, I, I, I did my first degree. I started my first degree when I was 11. That was at King's College in London, and that was for psychology. Uh, when I finished that, um, I then went to a Queen's College, sister college, and I did classics. Uh, that enabled me to travel the world. Um, I specialised in ancient mythology and um, dead languages. Um, uh, that took me nowhere. Um, uh, the first year I did that, um, my mother had passed away, so I spent um, quite a lot of time and, and that and part time and looking after my younger disabled brother and doing all these different things, as well as going to school and doing all this other stuff. So that was a very trying time. Uh, at 22, 23, uh, I started the law degree, uh, which I finished. I did the law degree, I did the LPC, which is the uh, Legal Practitioners course. And I did 18 months of a two year training contract. Um, I decided not to do the full 24 months um, because uh, I clearly upset someone and they moved me from private client um, and advanced uh, property law into RTAs, road traffic accidents, <laughs> uh, which is basically how I describe my legal career, <laughs> just a road traffic accident. So then I, um, I had to regroup um, and I'll regroup by starting back when I was 17 a little bit. So you've got the three degrees, the losses, all that stuff. But um, when I was 17 uh, was the year that my mother had passed away and I started my second degree. Um, my mother passed away, she passed away and left me uh, and my brother with quite a few debts. Um, so in order to deal with the debts, we had to sell the family house. Um, and once we sold the family house, there was a little bit left over. Um, and I started working for my cousin, who was my first mentor. And he said, oh, we have to buy you something, you know, something to bring you some income, some money. <laughs> So he, um, he dragged me down to an auction uh, and I bought a, uh, uh, everyone loves this story, I mean, it's painful, um, I bought a, uh, a funeral home. So my um, uncle always told me uh, there are two things people are always going to need in life, somewhere to live and somewhere to die. Um, he wasn't wrong, that, that business is still going on, I think it's maybe fourth or fifth generation. Um, but I bought it about nine, nine or ten months into buying it. Um, Oh, I should recap. The reason I bought it is because I thought this isn't going to go under. That's the one thing you always worry about, right? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> it's one of the things you always worry about with commercial tenants. Unlike residential tenants, it's fairly easy to, to relet and do things like that. Commercial takes a little bit longer and I didn't want that many voids. So I thought, what makes this um, funeral home a little bit more attractive than other ones? Well, it had its own um, cremation oven out the back. I thought, well, wow, they're saving costs. Uh, um, and um, I thought, okay, well, you know, I thought, how, how can I make the most of this? So I bought it, I think, for about £60,000. Uh, about nine, nine, ten months in, um, I get a call from the tenant saying, um, is anyone here upset with foul language? I tend to be quite expressive. Hands up if you're upset. No, brilliant, we'll do word for word. Uh, you are a little bit? No, trust the Kiwi. <laughs> um, no, so he said, the fucking place has blown up. <laughs> At which point I'm like, what, 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 um, what, 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 blew, what blew up? Like, is it, I'm 17, <laughs> dealing with the loss of a mother, looking after my younger disabled brother. I've invested in a property far younger than most people tend to do in the first place. I'm this close from a nervous breakdown, um, and the place blew up. So it took me three or four days to really kind of consider what had happened uh, and how to fix it. Um, so the insurance companies say that when someone changed the gas canister and they use like, I don't know, like rocket fuel, I don't know what they use, but it's got to be strong enough to, to break down bone. That's a, not a great start this evening. <laughs> um, but to break down bone. And basically someone had put it in and the cable that they have attaching it was kinked. Kinked the right word? Kinked? Yeah, we'll go for kinked. Um, and basically uh, it had a little hole worn into it. So one day they turned the oven on and the bloody thing went through the roof. So just so you know, this was mid terrace. It was two stories ground and first floor was where they kept the coffins because they're fun people. It went 
through the top floor, through the roof, and landed in the next door neighbour's roof, which was, I think, a two bedroom flat at the time. So, then, first property. My exit strategy with this property was basically <laughs> to own it. Uh, there wasn't really an exit strategy. Um, I had to find an exit strategy pretty, pretty quick. But um, I realised actually it wasn't all doom and gloom. Uh, it very easily could have been doom and gloom, but it took about three or four days to really kind of address and, and have a look at the situation from, from a height. Um, the insurance company for, for the business covered everything internally. Buildings insurance covered the material of the building and the next door neighbours had a nice new roof. I then sold the property after increasing the rent on the rent review. Um, and I sold it for, I think, about 140. I bought it for 60. So that was my exit strategy, and that was an exit strategy without realizing I actually needed an exit strategy. Um, so what I like to tell people is, especially when I'm talking about how many people have read the book or looked at the book? I know some people have put their hands up, it? lovely, a couple. Uh, so in, in the book, there is a whole chapter dedicated to exit strategy and, and the way that I structure my exits. So I'm always thinking in reverse order. This is much better with the slides. I'm always thinking in reverse order. Um, so I always start with the end in mind, what I'm looking to achieve, how I'm looking to achieve it. How many people have gone to an auction in, in here? Just by raising the hands, how many people have gone to an auction? Keep those hands up, everyone, don't be shy. Uh, how many people have tried to bid on a property? Keep your hands up if you have. No, how many people have tried to bid on a property but sold far more than you were willing to pay for it? Everyone else, yeah? Pretty much, beautiful. Uh, why I'm always asked is, they paid too much for that. What, what are they going to do? They're like, okay, well, let's calm down. The chances are that in this situation, your exit, if you're maybe a HMO landlord or maybe you're into service accommodation or maybe you do something else that's really quite nice within the property industry, maybe you just have that one strategy. The other person may have a different strategy which provides them more profit. So if you were to look at it from a single let to a multi-let to serviced accommodation, you're looking at three different types of what I like to call steroidal income. <laughs> Every step you take is <coughs> bigger, bulkier and better. Um, so you don't know what that person is going to do that allows them to pay that little bit more than you are going to pay. So when I talk about exit strategy, I'm always thinking about how can I pay the least and get the most? Or if I need to pay the most, I can still get the most from the exit. So I'm going to tell probably the most impressive story I've got. Um, and this was 2009. 2009 I was working as a property consultant and this was uh, for high net worth individuals I had about seven or eight clients uh, net worth um, uh, was about three billion between the, the seven of them right um, so these are big people and uh, one of them said uh, I'm just going to give you a million pounds which was absolutely nothing I mean he must sneeze and a million pounds comes out it's, it's no problem at all give me give you a million pounds but you're tasked to double it within two years this was 2009, this was the year after the financial crash. The market had gone completely to pot. So I thought, okay, I'll, uh, I'll take the bet. So um, I sourced the property in uh, Birmingham on the Hagley Road. Anyone know the Hagley Road? Anyone yeah. know Birmingham? Mm -hmm. Sweet. Office building, uh, four storeys, massive car park. Um, it was producing about half a million pounds uh, per annum coming in. And I bought it for half a million pounds because the income was gross, the net income was about £50,000. So I bought it on a 10%. Um, the, uh, the inhabitants of the commercial property were um, the local authority, two departments, and a, and a charity, and a couple of other people that had been there for donkey's years. Um, but it was run and serviced, um, and it was, it was losing so much money. There, there was arguments and, and things that maybe some of the management were taking a lot of the money um, themselves in cash and it wasn't quite computing into to what it would be. So I sacked the management, <coughs> I changed the infrastructure. So it gave me a million, I bought it for 500,000. This was all before the crazy stamp duty and other stuff. So legal fees and everything, I did most of the legal work myself. Um, I then took another 250,000 pounds from his one million pound pot that he'd given me. Um, I put T1 uh, broadband in there. I put uh, electronic um, key fobby locks mm -hmm. and all that stuff. Uh, I made each floor an IRI. Does anyone here know what IRI is? Does anyone know what FRI is? Okay, so for uh, commercial property you've got um, fully repairing insuring lease. Basically it means that the uh, tenant is responsible for making sure that the building is fully repaired and insured for their term um, of renting that property. IRI is internal repairs and insuring, which means they're only dealing with the internal skin and fabric of the building. 
So I wasn't going to give them FRI because uh, I couldn't do that because it, the whole building wasn't structured like that. So I gave them IRIs. When I'd finished, it was netting half a million pounds. So I completely turned the entire building around. That was in 18 months. I then sold it to a pension fund for five million pounds. So that was my exit strategy from the very beginning. But I worked the exit in three ways. Exit one, told the management to bugger off because <laughs> they were definitely doing something dodgy. Um, exit two was I just upgraded the services to the building. Very simple. And renegotiated leases or created new leases where there were just licenses and things like that. I could have exited at either one of those points and probably made about three or four hundred thousand pounds quite easily. But the fact that I decided to go for the, the, the whole run meant that actually at the point of exiting I, I'd, I'd maximised the value in the asset drastically. So when I'm talking multiple exit strategy, which is probably the first time I've said that today, so exit strategy but multiple exit strategy, every single property I look at I have three potential exits for. So those three potential exits are end exits. These are things that I'm going to do to achieve the maximum value of that out of that property. Now I have three points in the transaction or in the ownership of the property where I'm instantly adding value in each one of those three. So three times, so there's potentially nine exits in one property transaction. How many people here do due diligence on their properties uh, on like a spreadsheet? Anyone here use spreadsheets? Yeah, I'm a spreadsheet junkie as well. Beautiful. How much time on average you can shout out, don't be shy, did you spend doing uh, due diligence on a single property? Hours. On average, an hour uh, to look for comparables, yeah, make a decision, longer. call an agent. Mm -hmm. I do eight hours minimum per property. And that again comes into four different parts. So there's two hours at each step. So I normally go through auction catalogs, that's normally where I find the bulk of the properties that I'm looking at. And out of 150 properties, I'll narrow it down to about 10 or 15. From that 10 or 15, that's within the first two hours, I do some due diligence, I normally get rid of a third of those, so I'm down to 10. I then get rid of a third of those, I'm probably down to five. And by the time I'm finished, I probably have one or two properties that I'm looking at in, in, in earnest. Now, in uh, in your due diligence, uh, how many people, how, uh, just for show of hands, how many people here are residential investment, residential only, like landlords, HMOs, that kind of stuff, all the fun stuff. How many people commercial? Just the Juan. All right, no problem at all. How many people want to get into commercial? Want to give it a go? Good, yeah. Apart from the high street stuff, we all hear terrible things about the high street. There are ways around that. Um, so. The majority of things that I buy are commercial premises because they provide a multitude of exits that residential, strictly speaking, doesn't allow for, especially in this market. You used to be able to in the old days, I say maybe old days, about five or six years ago, you used to be able to buy a property, refurb it, and in the time it's taking you to do that, the market's grown 10%, you can sell in happy days. You get the 10% in the market growth and the 10% in terms of the value that you've added to the property and people are walking away 20-25% up on, on their investment. It's difficult to do that at the moment. So how many people, their strategy here was just to buy, refurbish, maybe re-rent and resell? Three re's, yeah? Refurb, re-rent, resell. Lovely. How many people are still making a lot of money out of that at the moment? Bear in mind I've got nothing to sell, you're getting a free book tonight if you sign up with Ranches. <laughs> Doesn't sound like a sell, I'm just trying to get a flavour for the people in the air. Uh, not in the room. Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, have that yeah, we wouldn't have that inside. Um, I just get, I keep coming up with case studies. Unless anyone has any specific questions at this point. No, everyone's good. Beautiful. So, a current property that I have at the moment, which I'm really very proud of, illustrates my three exit strategy perfectly. I bought a double fronted charity shop in Runcorn, just outside of Liverpool. I bought it three months before Runcorn Borough Council announced that they were building a super highway directly into Liverpool. Um, so that's added value. I, I didn't by any chance know that they were going to do that, so it was, a, it was completely fortuitous. Um, <laughs> but what I did is I, I bought it, it's two stories, so double fronted two story. I like buying charity shops, I like buying funeral homes. I used to buy betting shops, but then I got married and the wife doesn't like gambling, so I can't buy betting shops anymore. <laughs> that and they've changed the dynamic of, of how you value betting shops. Um, so they're really very difficult to get the kind of value out of them that you'd expect. Um, so I've now moved away from betting shops. I still buy the odd bank building, normally vacant or normally with the end of term approaching. But the building I've got at the moment, like I said, is double fronted. First floor is, is um, ancillary, but it's important to notice that it's 
rated the same value as the ground floor, the commercial area. So if you want to do permitted development, so uh, commercial to residential, the floor that you're doing the permitted development on has to have the usage to do it, otherwise you can need planning. Ancillary doesn't come under the um, permitted development rules. So fortunately, that was the case with this property, and you check that out on the VOA, uh, that's the Valuation mm -hmm. Office Agency. They tell you the ratings of the floors and all that kind of stuff. Um, there is a large courtyard to the rear. Um, so when I got this, I got it about 18 months ago. Um, all I've done is just take the rent. The property was sold as a TOGC. Any, uh, any accountants in property accountants in the room? No? no. TOGC is a transfer of going concern, which basically means that you're delaying the VAT purchase on a property that is so you're selling the business and the transfer of the rent uh, of, of the rates for the VAT is transferred alongside it. So if I was to not do a TOGC, I would have had to have paid an extra £25,000 on top of the purchase price, which wouldn't have killed the deal, but I bought it for 80. It's producing £10,000 per annum, so it's not too bad as it is. Um, the first initial exit was uh, they didn't have their rent review two years before I bought it, three years before I bought it. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to do the rent review. Um, and I was going to do the rent review and I realised actually if I do the rent review now um, I won't be able to take the first floor off them because that's what I want to do. I want to take the first floor and I want to do a residential development there. That's how I fully take the advantage of the property, right? It's a two-storey property on a four-storey parade of shops and it's a corner unit which they call a landmark site so you can sometimes go an extra floor on top. Um, anyone here do, does development or planning gain? Anyone? Planning uplift? One or two? Beautiful. So you guys get what I'm saying? Beautiful. Um, so I wanted to take the uh, top floor back, but if I take the top floor back, there's no point doing that now because when I renegotiate the lease, chances are I'm probably going to have to um, neg down on, on the uh, income, which means instead of being like a 12% yield, it's going to be about an 8% yield, and it doesn't work for what I want to do. So I'm going to let the lease run, which is something that commercial people tell everyone not to do. Um, but the reason I'm going to do that is because I know that the people that are running this charity shop have been there for 25 years already. They're not going anywhere. Uh, and I've picked a type of tenant that tends not to migrate or close down anyway. Uh, I've already had um, conversations with them about extending the, uh, the tenancy. And like, okay, well, well, they're having the discussion. It's coming, it's coming, it's coming. So exit one was to renegotiate the lease, but that's not going to work. So I've cancelled exit one. Exit two was to renegotiate the lease for a higher amount while still taking the first floor off them. Now, how are you going to do that? Because you're taking something away from them and you want them to pay more money for it. Yeah. So when you're rating a commercial property, you have three zones. Zone A, Zone B and Zone C. Zone A is the frontage, the shop frontage. So you'll find that the value of a commercial property is almost exclusively or primarily based on its window frontage. That's the stuff that the punters will see walking past it, right? You go past shop, um, the zone A, you go to zone B. Zone B is about half the rateable value of zone A. You go past zone B, uh, you <laughs> down the stairs, <laughs> which I probably would do. Um, you go past zone B, uh, then you go to zone C. Now there is zone D, but that's only for like really, 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 really deep shops. And I have a case study for really deep shops. But does anyone, does anyone here know Ranjan Bhattacharya? Mm -hmm. I heard him yeah. talk on, on that. Basically, anything that goes too far into zone D, it's basically worthless. So what you want to try and do is you want to try and hive that off and do a little studio flat at the rear. If anyone's heard him talk about that, he probably does a far nicer talk on that. But I've done that on two occasions, uh, and it's been really nice. And it doesn't affect the value of the shop that you're dealing with at the moment. Yes, so, um, so I, I go off on tangents. I'm really sorry. Um, <laughs> so... Basically, what I've decided to do is I'm going to, in the rear courtyard, I'm going to create, there's uh, two, two entrances, well, there's one entrance at the moment. I'm going to create another entrance. So I'm going to create one entrance that will go to the existing stairwell that goes to the first floor. So now I have a separate entrance to the flats. It doesn't affect the commercial value of the frontage of the building. The second exit I'm going to create is into the rear of the premises, and I'm going to build some storage, the stuff that kind of bolts into the walls where they can put all of their stuff into nice neat storage. They don't need the first floor. So I'm replacing the foot by foot with uh, external storage. And also I'm gonna say it to them as they don't have to worry too much about fire hazard and they don't have to worry about health and safety because I'm gonna go up and down the stairs. I'm aiming that these people have got a lazy bone in their body because <laughs> I don't like going up and down stairs. Um, 
And that's basically exit two. I'm going to renegotiate the lease. If I do it at market value, instead of paying £10,000 per annum in the current market, they'll be paying £16,000 per annum. If I was to sell that at a 10% yield, which shouldn't be difficult, I bought it for one. I bought it for 80. At a 16% yield, I can sell it for at a 10% yield. I can sell it for 160. The math is simple. That's double. But why would you stop there? Because I want to do the PD. Now the PD, the internal conversions, isn't going to cost a great deal. I know a guy who'll do that, and I can probably take out some <coughs> um, finance to do that. So some development finance there. And I'm going to do the PD. But what I'm also going to do is I'm going to put in planning permission for two additional floors to bring the building in line with the rest of the uh, rest of the high street. When I do that, I'm going to go for four flats up there. So I'm going to end up with six flats in total. The flats sell anywhere between 75 and 105,000 pounds, depending on square footage and um, fit and finish. I'll be aiming anywhere for around the 85 mark, really, 80 to 90, probably set at 85. And uh, I'm not going to pay a penny for those. I've already arranged a joint venture with a, a builder. He's going to build the six, he's going to take the three for himself, and he's going to give me the three. So I get the ground floor commercial unit and three flats for free. Pretty much no money left in, no money down, no money over, all that stuff, all the things that people like hearing. Yeah? Um, so that's the one I've got at the moment, that's the one I'm really proud of. And everything is pretty much lined up for that one. Um, and I was looking at something else that's not too dissimilar recently that I think I might do like a copy, uh, you know, a cookie cutter copy of that. Um, I was also, um, for Piot, who I've co-written the book with, I sold a property for him recently at auction. Uh, it was a, um, it was like a barber shop at the front or a hair and beauty shop at the front. And at the rear it was like a, a, an old, uh, uh, like, like a garage, but basically he turned the garage into like an office. He got permissions to do that, it's not that difficult. And basically that dead space at the rear, he got yielding seven and a half thousand pounds a year. So that was uh, 12 and seven and a half. And there is a leasehold flat above, which is sold off with 60, 53 years left on the lease. Does anyone know anything about short lease houses or flats? Beautiful, I've got a ton of value to add. You? No, no, no. was it just because I pointed at you? All right, no, okay, cool, brilliant. So um, we'll go through that as well, um, the short lease housing and flats. So just so you know, my main investment criteria are mixed use, primarily commercial. Um, I do leasehold flats, short leasehold flats and short leasehold houses. Um, I also buy freehold ground rents where I get the chance uh, and every once in a while I'll do something with a development added value bit to it. Um, so that's one case study. Um, the other one I've got is, a, oh, this is a good one. Um, I brought a block of eight flats from a local housing charity trust. Now you normally only get a local housing trust or a local housing charity, but these people were special and they had a bit of both about them. So I bought it, uh, again I think I bought this one for 75,000 pounds for eight flats in uh, Shropshire. Uh, ten, not ten, no, Shropshire, yeah. So I bought it in Shropshire. Um, two of the flats were sold off, uh, the top two. Um, four of the flats were let and two of the flats were in complete shell condition. But the charitable trust were nice enough to leave brand new boilers in the two that, <laughs> that needed completely gutting and restarting again. So I saved about 10 grand on the refurb, just new boilers sitting in there. So that's just a stroke of luck. Um, but basically, uh, of the uh, four that were let, um, I sold two because they were decent yielding um, for £65,000 each. Bear in mind, I bought the whole thing for £75,000. So everyone knows the mass, and now no money left in. I then used that overage to refurb the bottom two flats. Uh, I then sell the middle two flats and I'm left with the ground floor two flats recently refurbished, recently let, everything is going well. The only thing I can't do is I can't manage residential tenants. So I've got a management company in place. I'm not really a people person with people that, that would call me up at two in the morning for a leaky tap. I haven't got it in me. I've got, I've got none of that. I, I give palpitations, like they moved in. I don't know if it was set up early enough. And, but what if they call me instead of the agent? I haven't got anything. Commercial tenants is B to B, business to business. So you, they call you and let, they don't call you unless the thing blows up. <laughs> and I can attest to that. They will blow. They'll call you when it blows up. Um, so basically, I'm, I'm no money left down in that as well. And I also have two flats that are just sitting there doing whatever it is that they're doing. And if I need some additional cash or, or uh, I don't want the cash flow anymore, then I can obviously sell those two off. And they won't be too difficult to sell. Um, I can sell them tenanted or vacant. There's a part of me that thinks in the current market, I'll wait for them to go vacant. Um, I'm starting to see a trend at auctions um, 
since the whole Section 21 thing that hasn't been going on for too long, um, is that um, vendors who sell their properties at auction don't put all of the required information for investors to purchase the property with, with you know, full disclosure. So, and what I mean by that is like the gas safety certificates, the, the right to rent thing, all the other stuff that residential tenants need to be, you know, for you to kick them out if you need to or whatever it is. So I am, um, I don't know if I want to sell them tenanted. I think in a certain respect that may devalue them or make them a little bit less attractive. When I sold the last ones, uh, they were really very easy to deal with. Um, so I may go vacant and then say previously let out or estimated rental value of and then just show the records of that in the legal pack. Someone can knock themselves out from there. Um, so that's what I've got going on at the moment. Um, my exit strategy for that in the end is I want to ma maintain the freehold. It sounds ridiculous, but I brought that entire block of flats not because it was unbroken freehold because two of them were sold off not because all the other flats were left that was a pain in the arse for me i don't really want to deal with residential tenants for a long period of time um but i just wanted the freehold just the ground rent <coughs> so what i'm going to do is i'm going to put some um solar panels on the roof you can get a government grant for solar panels and i'm going to get the freehold um not only paying back into the system but having an overflow as well which will increase the value of the freehold so when I bought the property, the freehold had a rough value. Bear in mind, none of the leases were reversionary. So the reversionary means that they were over 80 years. So there's no additional intrinsic value there. By the time it starts paying back into the grid, I should be able to increase the value of the freehold from about three to four thousand pounds to about 10. So again, it's just another little kind of cherry on the top. Um, it's an additional exit. So if I sold off all the flats, I can still play around with that for a year or two but it would cost me absolutely nothing to do it or next to nothing. And I've had all the profit to play with from it anyway. Um, any other examples of fun stuff? Yeah, okay. So here's another one. It's one of the few ones that I've developed out myself. I haven't done any grassroots developments. I don't think I'm smart enough yet, but I'll get there. Um, so this was a, a, a three bedroom mid terrace house in Plasto, Plasto, I can never say how to say it. South London somewhere. Real grotty shit all this place is, but the road it's on is called Grange Road, and Grange Road is a beautiful road. It's got a tree lined, it looks lovely. Um, and I saw a picture of it, and it was one of the stupid occasions where I bought something without viewing it. Read the book, never ever do that. <laughs> Caveat emptor, view the bloody properties, don't do what I do. Um, and uh, it looked beautiful, and I thought, all right, I'm now I've, I've completed, uh, I'm going to go down and view it. And I drove down, uh, and <laughs> I drove down, and I was driving there, and I didn't have the amount of times I checked to see if my door was locked. <laughs> it was, I, I honestly thought I was going to get stabbed in my car. So, <laughs> not the best of areas. I hope this isn't going too light. But not the best of areas. Um, but what it did mean is actually I, I managed to nab it at probate, uh, which means before it got onto the market, before it went to the estate, before anything like that happened, um, a friend of mine was local in the area. Said, "Look, they're going to sell this. Here's a picture of it. Do you want it?" And I thought, "Okay, for two hundred and fifty thousand pounds for a three-bedroom house in." Okay, crappy London, but still London, it can't be too bad, right? I was wrong. Um, I, I, I admit when I'm wrong, uh, the amount of mistakes that I've made. Um, blowing up buildings, uh, again, it wasn't me, but it's a mistake nonetheless. Um, I bought it and I thought, oh, this is great because um, doing some research, again, part of my due diligence is every single property I buy, I go on the local planning website. That's not specifically because I'm gonna put plan any planning and gain into that property, but I wanna know what everyone on that road has either done or tried to do, because that increases my exits. If they've done stuff and it, it's added massive value, then that increase, that's what I'm gonna move on to, that's what I'm gonna do next. But if they've been doing it and no one's making the effort, then I can adjust my price to just a vanilla three bedroom, blah, 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 blah right? Um, so I got lucky. I saw on the planning portal that pretty much uh, maybe uh, two out of every three properties had been turned into a, a ground floor flat and a two story maison above for art. I was having the time of my life. I was like, yeah, buy it, 250, let's do it. Um, just an FYI, I buy all of my properties cash. That's not because I have the cash, I have to sell the properties to free up the cash to do it. But it's because I, I've got such a small pot to play with that I, it kind of irks me paying interest to someone else. It's not the smartest way to do property investment. It really isn't. Because if I was to do 70% loans about it, probably means I could do two or three more deals at a time. I could probably double or treble my profit. I could do all those things and people always laugh at me for it. But it's a comfort thing at the moment. But I'm, I'm, I'm speaking to a couple of people about maybe, maybe bankrolling me in some way, shape or form where I can probably LTV the Christ out of whatever I buy for them. 
So I'm looking at doing something like that. So I bought this um, 100% cash, £250,000. All the costs, this was 2013, this was four months before I got married. Uh, going away for the honeymoon, uh, it really annoyed the wife, this property. Cause it, everything, every email I got was another issue, it was another problem, something was going wrong. Uh, it's a problem when you, you buy something just because it looks pretty, right? Um, anyway, I, I got the planning permission, eventually. They refused the planning twice and it went to appeal. Um, they refused it twice because they said it would be over <laughs> densification of people in, in the area. I thought, oh, it's rubbish because every other house is like that. Um, but I got it because basically there was enough precedent on the road that they couldn't refuse it on inspectorate. So once it goes through to appeal. How many people look at a property that's got failed planning and think, oh, if they're not going to get planning, I'm not going to get planning. How many people have done that? No one looks at stuff with planning? Right, we'll move on. Nice and simple. <laughs> Uh, I was going to tell everyone a little secret there, but no one put their hand up. Oh, no. Oh, no. Okay. There we yeah, go. Yeah. <laughs> Did you? You look. Okay, beautiful. Has anyone here heard of a guy called Paul Higgs? Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 That's who taught you. Paul Higgs, uh, the guy's a genius. Um, but basically, what I do is something that he's been doing for donkey's years, but on a much bigger scale, is I look at stuff where someone's going to try to go in for over planning, or, has, or, not in a, or where they haven't actually made the best use of the site. So I, um, when I did my law degree, actually, I, I specified or I specialised in property, land, advanced property, private client and stuff like that. And when I was working as a consultant, I was doing planning gain. So I've been doing planning gain for, for about 12 years. Um, and I thought, okay, well, I'm going to start looking at sites that have been like failed planning. So they did this. And the, the secret I'm telling you here is if you see failed planning, don't instantly dismiss it because you don't know what numpty has gone in for some crappy planning. Uh, they haven't followed the UDP, that's the Unitary Development Policy of the Local Borough Council. They haven't checked the, the planner's website. They haven't done a steel cut calculation or 106 calculation if it's over 10 or 12 units, depending on the local borough. They haven't done any of that work and they instantly dismiss it go, it's too much, no one's ever going to get planning. If you can't get that, you can't get anything. So what I did in this instance is I saw that everyone was getting the planning and then I got refused twice. So again, I'm at, I'm at this point where I'm like, stones throw away from a nervous breakdown. You'll tell I'm, I'm, I'm not really that uh, strong willed but <laughs> every time something goes wrong, nervous breakdown's on the bound. Um, and um, yeah, so uh, I bought it. Uh, it took about nine months to get the uh, planning refused. Uh, they were nice enough to say it took me nine months to get the planning refused. Um, and at this point, I'm starting to run out of ideas. So then I changed the planning slightly. So what I did was I did a staged planning. Has anyone heard of staged planning before? Right, so staged planning is when you go in for half of what you want to achieve in the first instance, which fits nicely into the, GD, uh, the UDP, and then you go in for the uplift of planning. Right? So what I did was I went in for simple planning of rear extensions. Rear extensions. So I was gonna turn that, um, that ground floor unit, well, it wasn't a unit yet, the ground floor area into a self-contained uh, two bedroom flat. So I needed the rear extension. They granted the planning on the rear extension, but they wouldn't give me the division to subdivide the property to do a roof extension to turn the first and second floors into a, uh, it was gonna be a, a two bed with a study. Some people call that three. Two bed with a study. And that one, that was the one that went to appeal. So uh, I appealed it, I won. I did the development, I did everything. I created the leases. Uh, so title splitting, I enjoy doing that as well. Has anyone done title splitting before? One or two? Cool, brilliant. Yeah, it's a little bit exotic, but it's a lot of fun if you know how to do it. Same thing with buying a block of flats and then creating leases and selling those off. You're basically, uh, the parts are worth more than the whole. So it's just a great case of calculating what that would be. So I've already sold these two units off and I'm left with the freehold. And I get a letter about four months later from uh, the, the local planner saying, ah, uh, here's an enforcement notice. Does anyone know what an enforcement notice is? It's not nice. It gives you squeaky bum time, right? It's not a good time. Um, basically, the enforcement notice was to, <laughs> to turn it back into a single dwelling. So I wrote back, I said, no, here's my planning, here's everything, here's that, and here's this, that, and the other. By the way, this story uh, highlights the one time I almost lost, prop lost money on a property deal. Fortunately, I never have, but you'll hear the end of the story and you'll hear how ridiculous that is. So I almost lost money on this deal. Um, and I argued it for another 12 months that I had the planning and all this and all that. Um, and then it was, it was a £20,000 enforcement notice. 
So it basically meant that they were going to charge me £20,000. Then whoever tried to sell it, it would be difficult to mortgage. And every time someone tried to buy it, they'd serve them an enforcement of £20,000. Basically devaluing the property like, like through the floor. It was a crash. So I thought, I've got to try and negotiate myself out of this one. Um, and if no one's noticed so far, I can talk crap until the cows come home. I talked myself out of it. But um, basically I had to pay £5,000 for the enforcement on the agreement that they retracted the enforcement and allowed the development to go forward. And some people say, why did you cave in and why did you pay them anything? Well, it turns out that they fucked up. In the planning, they didn't put in a, um, a condition of the planning that they wanted to put in. So it had all the building rigs, had everything. And they were beautiful flats, probably too nice for the area. But it was a, it, they were beautiful flats. Um, and basically, they failed to put something in the decision notice and they were trying to penalise me for it. So I had to think, it was a commercial decision, do I just battle this battle <coughs> until my dying day, bless you, or do I just try and settle? So I've owned this property at this point almost three years, um, and uh, I sold the freehold, I sold it off, uh, and after everything was done and good and finished, I made £990 profit. <laughs> but I've never lost money. <laughs> um, if anyone wants to be pedantic and point out the fact that three years of my life and time spent and all that stuff doesn't equate to it, just... <laughs> Let me live with my lives, all right? Um, but that's basically, um, that's basically how my exit strategies work. They're formed out of the necessity not to fall into the same mistake. So I normally look at hindsight, I normally look at insight and foresight. So insight and foresight is your due diligence, and hindsight is remembering all the fuck-ups you've made along the way. Um, I normally, uh, at any point within the transaction, reconsider my exits at every single stage. I normally go into every single property before I do any real due diligence and I normally forecast what my exits are going to be. I then allow the due diligence to cancel some exits out and create new exits. So I'm not in a fixed scenario, I'm not in a fixed position. It has enabled me to buy more properties either for myself or before I work for Auction London for my clients um, quicker, easier and sometimes cheaper than other people are able to buy at because I created that degree of flexibility. Um, yeah, uh, there's a ton more stuff on the slides, but to be honest, I can't remember all the individual mm, bits. Um, I've got a couple more case studies if anyone's still open to hearing any. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. You've got a quick question. Question. Uh, you mentioned about the betting shops. Yeah. Obviously, there's a lot of betting shops going to the shop. Is yeah. that something you would take an interest in? Do you or, or do you think, you know, high street? And I would take an interest in them, but there's a lot of betting shops that were on um, secondary parades. Uh, I would, instead of going high, so you've got high street, mm. you've got um, a, primary, a, a primary shopping location, you've got secondary parade and you've got tertiary. So tertiary is like a row of houses and then a little corner shop, that's considered tertiary. So if it's in a secondary or tertiary position, absolutely I will. Because normally the class use for that property would enable you to do some kind of community development. So if it closes down or it goes vacant, my plan B would be conversion to residential, move on with my life. Easy, but if, yeah. it's, if it's in primary, if it's in primary, um, you would. Uh, uh, it's a good class use that they have. Um, so it just depends on, on what, what your 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 risk and reward ratio is. Um, for something like that, depending on the location and the cost, um, I probably would look at it, but probably at maybe a, a fifty to sixty pence in a pound discount, because I would probably have to hold it vacant, paying rates for a couple of months before I get it re-let to something that isn't a betting shop. Um, so I would be forecasting that, that, that pain point. Um, th the reason why a lot of betting shops are closing down is not because people have stopped betting. One <coughs> of it is the same reason why the high street it seems to be closing down is because it's cheaper to, and easier to do it online, right? Mm -hmm. um, but actually, uh, about seven or eight years ago, they changed the way that you value betting shops. I think I mentioned that briefly. I do talk very fast and some of it's crap. Um, but um, I... Uh, Self-deprecating, I can't help myself. It's a Jewish guilt. Uh, so, um, yeah, so the reason that is is because uh, the laws changed uh, in terms of um, the electronic gambling devices like um, that you'd find in, in the betting shops, right? So the laws changed, and, and when you do a um, cost analysis and profit ratio on a, um, on a betting shop, it yields far more down, even if they're paying a the great, it yields down. So, they're no longer a double or triple A covenant. And when it's commercial property, you're looking at the kind of covenant. And the covenant adds to the strength of the income, makes it more mortgageable, increases the chances they can be paying on a regular basis. 
Um, and betting shops, I think, dropped down to either an A or a double B rating. So it's actually gone down in value. So people have started fire selling them at the moment. You're seeing a lot of them come up at auction. Um, but yeah, yeah. so that, that's a rough answer. Yeah, so basically what you're saying is you wouldn't go for the one on the high street, you'd look for the, the one. Secondary or tertiary, yeah. absolutely, yeah. Because yeah. it increases your accessibility. Yeah. On high street, it's harder to, to do things like build a little unit out the back. Unless, it, depending on the composition of the building, you're taking or more risk. Or the local risk, authority. Or the local yeah. authority. Yeah. Uh, and if it's a pedestrianised one, it gets trickier and trickier. And if it's in a market or historical town, it gets trickier and trickier. So you, you just have to play your averages. All comes down to your due diligence. Not the same thing. Okay. So five years from roughly today, 2014-ish, yeah? Okay, so they're, they're, whereabouts are they? What part of the country? <laughs> okay, beautiful. Okay, you don't have to give me an address, it's fine. Um, <laughs> oh, no, yeah, no, of course, no, I've, I've, I've worked with Paul, but it's fine, I, I, get, I, I understand. So, um, most planning, especially if it's a small residential, they grant you planning, you have three years in which to enact the planning. That can be something as simple as digging a small trench and getting someone from the local authority to take a picture saying, yeah, the development has started. <laughs> now, if you're smart, that's what you would do. Because from the moment that trench is built, whether you build it, that planning is in force. Okay? Once it goes over the three years, even for some larger developments, and, unless you have like really big power like Barrett or, 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 or these other kind of Linden Homes people, where they can grant like five-year extensions before the start of the build, and because they don't forward fund those developers, it's the smaller developers that forward fund their projects. So you can do, you can work very easily within that three year period. Um, the majority of the reasons why you see things like that happen is normally um, they can't raise the finance. Um, it comes down to feasibility. You may, here's the thing. How many people here have next door neighbors? Or if you live in a detached place in the middle of nowhere, you're different, right? <laughs> You've got a next door neighbor, chances are, Tomorrow you can go on, you can open up a planning application, you can get planning to build them a roof extension. Why you would do it is completely beyond me, right? But you can get planning for absolutely anything. Or you, sorry, you can submit planning for absolutely anything. Now whether it is feasible to build it or not, that's a separate question. That's why people normally go in, well used to go in on an over, um, over cramped site and try and overdevelop, right? At the moment, they're not doing that. What people are doing is they're doing stage planning, which is what I was saying mm. to you earlier about the, the plan class day thing. Um, it's really very difficult to fund sites. And the one yeah. So. Uh, so has the planning lapsed? Yeah. Yeah. So unless unless the, you can normally find out if someone started planning by just calling up the planners and saying this is the reference. Uh, have you got any record that they've started planning? Like I said, most people just build a little trench and someone comes on, takes a picture, building regs, development's begun, right? And that's a good way to ascertain how they've structured that. Now, if it's five years and the planning has lapsed, um, then the chances are that the scheme isn't feasible, right? Because there are certain... Yeah, so what you can do is, is before you go in for full planning, you can, you can hedge your bets, especially if it's the first couple of times you're going to do it. And um, as much as residential investment is difficult at the moment and with all the legislative changes, I wouldn't recommend instantly jumping into c a development. It's a completely different skill set. There's a very good reason why I haven't done a grassroots development yet. I don't intend to for a long time. Um, a lot of people are jumping from residential to commercial, which is why a couple of people put their hand in the air and they said they want to learn a little bit more about commercial. It's safer, it's a real building asset. You, it's easier to understand, right? Um, if you are going to be looking at something like that 67 unit site, the feasibility of it has changed drastically over the last couple of years. Um, what I would recommend with something like that is I would... Alright, okay, cool. Um, again, that, doesn't, that, that only increases the, the land site, the, the, the cost of the, the build cost. Does anyone know how to value a site just in, in terms of the, the pure basics? No, ask that lady there, Sean. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so it's GDV. Uh, GDV um, is how much it's going to be worth when it's all built and sold. 
you then work back your build cost and then you won't work, then work back your your uh, your land purchase uh, if anyone has the time money or an inclination and you will need the money to do a Paul Higgs course I fully endorse and recommend it um, I haven't had the time yet but the guy is an absolute superstar it's one of the few property training courses that I actually think is worth its salt uh, and that's not a derogatory term on anyone else I haven't seen anyone else's but Paul's pretty good um, Really good. Yeah, that's if you want to move into decide. development, but yeah, and the way he talks about the psychology of submitting applications, and sometimes you know if you're submitting an application, it's going to be refused just because it's at local town and country planning level, but you know the UDP on a national level is fine. He'll then submit the planning, knowing it's going to be refused, but three a month or two before it's refused, he already submits the appeal. And if you know the local authority well enough, you'll know that most of them don't like appeals. They ask you to retract the appeal and then they negotiate with you on the planning. So it's a cheeky little trick there. Um, the other thing to talk about is probably the short leases. Um, I'm I've with one at the moment. <laughs> Beautiful. Uh, someone's getting value out of this. Is everyone else getting value out of this? Oh, yeah, yeah. Beautiful. All right, cool. Uh, I didn't stand in an hour's traffic for nothing. This is lovely. Um, you've got two types of short leases, especially for residential. It's primary residential that you would be looking at. Right? You can get leasehold land, but there's no point talking about that if you see it running right <coughs> a few miles. Um, but if it's flats, really very simple. You've got marriage value about 80 years. Um, once it goes from 80 years, the value drops uh, on, the, on the asset because it becomes hard to mortgage, then goes down to 70 years. Um, once it goes below 70 years, you're then at a free fall until you hit 50 years. Now, leasehold extension calculators the leasehold advisory service has a leasehold extension calculator. That's the one I recommend you use. And read what it says very carefully, because one woman made a drastic mistake. It said, how much, what is the value of the property once it is done up? Like once it has full market value. What she did was she put in how much she was willing to pay for it at that price. So the price of the extension was about £30,000 less than it should have been. Don't make that mistake. So that's, that's trick number one. Uh, read the calculator. Uh, the calculator will ask, is it in London or is it out of London? The uh, Leasehold Advisory Service, Leasehold Extension Calculator, and Google's your friend. Um, definitely do that. That's the cookie. There you go, leaseholdadvisoryservice.org. Uh, you just click on the thing, it'll tell you to click a button to say yes. And basically, it wants to know if it's inside or outside of London. It'll take the postcode, it'll ask for the ground rent. At last for when the lease expires, you have to do a reverse calculation on that, but it's nice and simple calculators are very helpful. Uh, and then it will give you an idea as to how much lease extension will cost. Now, me personally, whatever that calculator says, I add £10,000 on top of it straight away. Because that is the value at which the freeholder is going to come back to that. We can talk about freeholders in a second, but instantly they're going to want more. Because bear in mind, the only value to a freeholder isn't the ground rent or service charge, because they have to manage it, there's no money in there. The money is in the marriage value of extending the lease. That's, that's how freeholders make their money. Some of them do it on management of the, the insurance and the service charge, but that's, that's, it's, it's not as impressive as you think it would be. Um, again, I went off on a little tangent there. Someone picked me up, where did we go? Yes, so, um, no, he's gone again. <laughs> Pardon? Add 10 grand. Add 10 grand, good man, thank you very much. Act, lovely, good man. Um, so you add ten thousand pounds. That's what they. So you serve a section forty-two notice. That's the uh, landlord and tenant act section forty-two notice. The prerequisite of that is you would have to have owned the property for a minimum of two years. Yeah. If you haven't owned the property for a minimum of two years, what you do is you get the existing owner, in terms of you pay their cost to do this, to serve the section forty-two notice and assign the benefit to you, the incoming buyer. Right. Nice and simple. Ish. So that's what you want to do. Um, you serve the section 42 notice. Let's say the leasehold calculator says it's going to cost £20,000. You go in and you say, right, I'm going to, I'm serving a section 42 notice and I'm going to put £15,000 on there. Right? Why give it 20 or 25? I'm going to put £15,000 in there. The freeholder comes back. But before I go that, if the freeholder doesn't come back in the allotted time, you can automatically extend that lease by the section 42 notice price that you've provided. So if they don't come back, so if you say, oh, I'll extend the lease by £15,000, they don't come back to you, they have to extend the lease at that price. That's why it's important to know who the freeholder is. Right? Because if it's like a, one of the major freehold companies, they'll be back within days. <laughs> You're not going to win that battle, right? I then instantly, once let's say they do come back, we'll run through the whole scenario. If they do come back, they're going to come back about 10 or 20 grand high. So you put 15, they're going to come back at 30. 
the idea here is that you're going to negotiate somewhere in between, right? Uh, it doesn't always work, so you go to the leasehold advisory services tribunal and it all gets patted out and all that rubbish. But let's say it is agreed and you do it at £25,000, you extend the lease. Happy days, everything's nice and easy. Now, if they don't agree to it, um, so. Jay? Yes. When you, when you say about that, say £25,000 extend the lease. Yeah. What if, but is that, is that to, to make it into a 90 year lease or can you. That's a brilliant question. So the standard uh, lease extension is either 90 years or by the original lease term. Right, so if you have a 99 year lease, you can extend it by 99 years, right? You can uh, do a very simple one, so a very bland lease extension, just at the 90 years, which is the statutory lease extension length, uh, and that's really nice and easy. And you can do that either via deed of variation or a brand new lease. Now, if it's an old lease, your solicitor will recommend getting a whole new lease draft with new terms that make everything make sense. Um, sometimes it's worth that, sometimes it isn't, because if you have to redraft a whole new lease, you don't really get to do that by yourself. The freeholder has the input there. And a lot of freeholders in the last five or ten years have been putting this whole ground rent increasing every 15 years by doubling all that stuff. And you don't want that because it makes it harder to mortgage and it devalues the property. You don't want that. So sometimes I normally go for deed of variation. It's quicker. Basically, on land registry, there's an additional deed that goes on there. Lease was extended by X at X. Simple. Move on. It just makes it up to 90. Makes it, it either increases it by 90 or adds it up to 90. Yeah. Yeah. And then the price for that will be a differential, right? So when you're serving this section 42, you have to state what you're looking to extend it by. Um, on a couple of occasions, I've extended the lease uh, by 999 years, but you pay about treble for the extension cost. Then you have a virtual freehold and a peppercorn rent. So it all depends on how that how, how you're going to add value to that property, right? So if the property is only worth 350, and once you extend the, the cost of the lease by 90 years, it's 150 years or something like that, let's call it, you're in total left with, and all the properties on the road are 350 and you're up to 300, there's no point paying the additional money to make it a, a virtual freehold. So you just have to use a bit of thought, reason and logic in places, right? Uh, it's also an interesting thing to know about the freeholders. So you have um, professional freeholders, you have companies, you have individuals. You'll approach each of them in a slightly different way because they'll all react to you in a slightly different way and they'll all charge you slightly different amounts, right? Bear in mind, with a lease extension, I normally add £10,000 to associated costs. That's £5,000 legal and surveying fees for me. And in a lease extension, you have to pay the freeholders. Lease extension, well, you have to pay for their surveyor and legal fees as well. So if ever you're calculating a short lease extension, just put £10,000 in a piggy bank that you know you're never going to get any real value of, apart from if you've priced it into your extension and end value cost, mm -hmm. and then just put that there for professional services. Um, is all this in your book, by the way? The majority of it is, yeah. Sure. <laughs> yeah, so I, I talk about short lease of passion. I've, I've not one of the first properties, but when I, when I did buy a short lease, again, this far from a nervous breakdown because I didn't read the lease. From a solicitor, that's horrific. <laughs> or not solicitor, someone legally trained, that, that's horrific. But you make mistakes. Um, I went through a whole phase. Bear in mind, I've been doing this since I was 17, where I got into my early 20s, and um, I, was, I was like, calling myself an investor and entrepreneur and I was, there was like a lot of girls and I had really nice cars I spunk all the money up the wall uh, so I learnt the hard way uh, and everything I was doing I just got cocky and I just started making silly decisions I've got uh, read the bloody lease yeah read the bloody lease <laughs> <laughs> uh, my question is regarding your first case study that you mentioned about the commercial property the one that blew up uh, the first commercial property you have converted different parts uh, like you freed up the I know that's, it, that's, that's an ongoing thing that I'm dealing with at the moment. Yeah. I actually haven't gone through with that okay. yet. So well, I, that, that kind of strategy, so what kind of a strategy uh, uh, you suggest to follow? Like is it to mix, make, keep it mixed use or to buy a shop or a like, row of two shops together? If you and I convert the whole thing into this If you have the option, mixed use offers you far more exits. It also gives you a blended income. If anyone who follows Ranjan, Tell him I've plugged him on this quite a lot, yeah? <laughs> right? So, so he, he does this whole, he's got this thing on YouTube about um, five golden opportunities for commercial investments in the high street. He talks about blended income. So what that means is basically, I was taught if you buy a mixed use property, basically it's recession proof. I mean, it's not apocalypse proof or war proof, but it's recession proof because you've got the rental, uh, rental affordability curve for residential. Uh, for, for the residential element. And then you've got the commercial affordability in terms of their rates and 
footfall and all that stuff, right? So those are two kind of different calculations you have to take into consideration. Yeah. So in, in a situation for a mixed use, what you're doing is you're saying if the commercial went vacant, um, that's fine. I've got the residential, which is probably still going to pay the mortgage. The if the residential went vacant, I've still got the commercial. The chance of both of them going vacant are quite rare. And you normally see that where it's by design. Can anyone think of why you'd want the commercial and residential premises vacant for a long period of time? Well, there's no footfall in that area. Or no, no, area. why you would actively make it vacant rather than just happen to, to, de to develop it out. To develop it out. Because it means that the local authority, your, your petition to the local authority would be, look, no one wants to rent this, no one wants to buy it, no one wants to do anything with it. Let me change the use. Let me do something like that. <coughs> so there's a specific reason why someone would make that property empty. But I would recommend mixed but use. But the reason you're saying is, again, as an investor, do you have a very strong uh, insight into these kind of scenarios where when you're going to house it, if you don't live in that area and you buy a shop, you don't definitely understand the dynamics, how it all works there. Yeah. So you would, as an investor, go there and say, look, I'm going to convert the whole shop into flat. That's it, global strategy. Or you research in the local area, see and see what businesses work here. The one you mentioned, like uh, moving the two entity spaces on top and building something on the back to create that extra space so the shop yeah. still have that to back of house or anything like that. So is it driven from your research of the local area or is it a strategy part of the... Like it, it's, it's a strategy formed out of making mistakes. <laughs> uh, it's a strategy formed out of hopefully being able to make the most out of every asset. Mm. I don't overdevelop, I don't do tiny little closet studios or anything like that. I, I like quality. So I'm a bit of a snob at heart. I haven't got the money to be a snob, but I like to think I am. But lemonade money, not champagne. Um, so what I like to do is I, I like to go in there and completely rework the asset. I like creating things. I'm a creative person. So I like changing something here and then turning it into something 10 times better and sending, selling it, hopefully, 10 times the value. It only happens once uh, or twice. Just one more thing, because when you buy a commercial premises, they have a very less value. And then you add value through signing of lift. So you create the, the different change, design changes in an in asset to back I, it up. I normally buy properties that have failed to sell at auction on at least no less than two occasions. Okay. Okay. I'm normally looking for a very specific type of property in a very specific type of area at around the same kind of price point. I do that because it is very easy for me to, to, to achieve a greater outcome and there's very little effort or influx of energy required, right? So in a situation like this, yes, I'm always looking for something that is commercial on the ground um, and residential above. Now, in some circumstances, I made a mistake on this as well once. I hope everyone's enjoying this. Mm -hmm. uh, I made the mistake once of buying a commercial unit that was ground and lower ground. How many people have owned properties that have been over lower ground as well? None. Beautiful. I wouldn't recommend it. <laughs> so, uh, the reason I don't recommend it is because um, you get rising damp, you get structural cracking, you get all of it. And uh, I've not got the energy for that either. Uh, I, li I like to make things nice. Uh, I like buying in probably nice roads, the crappy property on the nice road and turning it into nice property on a fairly average road. But for the most part, it is commercial that I look at because it means that I'm de-risking. Uh, and that is, that's my entire life now in terms of property investing. Um, I've got the two deals on at the moment that I like to play with. Uh, I'm doing some more JVs with my co-author Piot. Uh, we're doing a couple of other things. Uh, and it's all about de-risking the asset and making the most of the asset. One thing you mentioned about you always buy a property cash, is it again driven from because you normally spend time on signing up lift side where you don't want to confine yourself with that, you don't I want to waste months yeah. and months I, and on I normally buy yielding assets, okay. yeah, so that there is an income coming in. The reason I, I, the reason is, the reason I don't take out the finance is because I want to maximise the profit. And there's, there's, there's a lot of people like on these Facebook groups and all this stuff, like, oh, that's not the real profit, got to net it down after all these costs and finance, so I'm like, okay finance if you took finance. I didn't take finance. So my, my, my capital appreciation and my profitability is higher. Now bear in mind, I only do that about the 70 to 150,000 pound value area, right? Um, that's not a massive amount of money, especially if I've sold off every other asset and I'm just sitting cash, which is the worst thing you can do. And the second worst thing you can do is buy something entirely in cash, not take any finance. Um, it's not an advisable thing to do. It works for me because that's the way I've structured things at the moment. It's extremely low risk. Um, it's also extremely high risk. Um, so when I, I sold three properties uh, in April 2017, and they were the last three properties I owned, and I was looking at buying a, um, a former convent 
in West Drayton, so it's like Ealing, like West London area. Beautiful building. They had like an apostolation, I can't remember what it like, little kind of thing. Beautiful building. Um, and they wanted a million for it. And I know I don't have a million pounds, but I know someone who does have a million pounds. I said, let's get this and we can do a development. And I've got an idea. I know that there's a couple of local housing authorities that are trying to build more flats in this area. So maybe we'll just sell them the, le the license to do the development and we'll take an overage or we'll do something. It'll be very little cost, but let's just secure it first. Um, and three days before we signed was the uh, Kaputski in 2007, 2008. Then I stepped out of the market at that point and I started investing in um, uh, banking stocks and shares. Uh, and don't ask me why I did that. Don't ask me. I, I, just because. I, the, the one bank that didn't take TARP funding was Barclays and it was devalued worse than the ones that did and I thought, how can this go wrong? So I bought about £60,000 worth of Barclays shares at 49 pence and then sold them at three pound forty nine. I like made three pound, brilliant. And then then I spent all the money, of course. I did. <laughs> um, but I'm thinking the next stage of my life, maybe I won't spend all the money all the time. <laughs> I'm not a portfolio investor. Um, I'm still trying to build the pot. So it's um, buy, add a shitload of value, sell at a profit, buy a shitload of value, and then just it's a stepping stone approach. And what I tend to do is I tend to start a little bit further out of town where it's affordable. I buy, I add the value, I take a step forward. I buy it, I add the value, I step forward, and it keeps bringing me closer and closer. It's a very old school way of doing things, um, but based on the resource, the current re finite resources I have available, it's what I would do. Uh, and it's also about reducing the risk as well. So sometimes you can be overexposed in city centres, and actually the commuter towns tend to do quite well and have a little bit more um, attractiveness to end users or indeed investors who know that they it's a 20 minute like bus journey or train journey into the centre of town. Mm. People are going to want to be on that little commuter belt bit where they've got the nice schools and uh, the nice fields. Excuse me, no, you mentioned about affordable, uh, but, but what I found is an affordable site is quite difficult to finance them because there's not much GDP you can create because uh, due to the local local area where those affordable schemes are. So how you normally suggest to finance those kind of schemes, how to make them viable? Because the problem with them is... You buy cash. It doesn't help you, unfortunately. Um, you're either going to want to buy cash or you're going to want to have some kind of um, private investment funding that will cover the majority and then you just get um, some kind of um, additional finance, so mezzanine finance to cover it off, or even some development finance. Again, I tend not to, to do um, ground up development, so it's not something that I would be proficient on or would want to comment on, but um, I, I tend to go for existing assets and transforming those moving on. At the moment, I'm kind of looking for old industrial buildings, <coughs> so like uh, old mills and things like that. I've got a really funky idea that I want to kind of do. Share it. Let's see, there you go. She wants to be a part of it. Share it. Um, so I can't, I, I, basically, I've tried to stay away from service accommodation and HMOs. Um, the reason I've tried to stay away from HMOs is because it just sounds like a really big headache. I don't like residential tenants at the best of time. Put ten of them in the same building, no, I'll be walking around like this all the time. I've not got it in me. So I thought, okay, well, I, I won't do that, but um, I like the idea of serviced offices. Then I realised, oh, I did take a service office once and turn it into an IRI investment and made 10% you know, 10 you know, capital growth on that very quickly. And I thought, well, maybe I don't want to do that. Then I saw like the rise of the whole WeWork thing and, and all these kind of like Higgy House and Luke, Luke Spikes and all those kind of people that are doing really successful things with service accommodation. So I thought, brilliant idea. Don't know if anyone's done it. Don't know if anyone's going to do it. But I wanted to create like a community hub. So like ground floor maybe would be some kind of Tesco's or co-op type of thing. Then the three floors above that would be some kind of, I don't know, office-y thing. And then two or three floors of residential. I thought, because the chances are you could, you know, you could Amazing. do something like that. And it would be, the impacting on that income would be immense. And I did look at something in Staffordshire. It was a uh, £70,000 for 3,000 square foot. So bear in mind, it's 3,000 square foot on a single floor. By the time you stick in additional floors, and it went four or five floors, you'd have 3,000 on each floor. Then you can start, you know, you need the imagination to play that kind of game. But that's what I'm thinking about doing. But I wasn't just thinking about doing it on one scheme. I was thinking about creating a brand and doing it on several schemes throughout the country and then creating a membership either for the um, commercial or residential. So people can, if you're in Leeds one day and like, okay, I'm going to go to Birmingham, you can actually just book room 306 and like almost like a hotel, but you don't pay more. You just pay an annual fee to live or work in those places. Oh. And I think actually in terms of, the, um, in terms of the current 
uh, you know, demographic and, and the millennials, which technically I fall under the bracket of, um, like to be transitory moving around, I think it would be a really good idea. God knows how I'll fund it or build it. <laughs> yeah, right. I like the it's idea. Sim- it's similar to it co-living, have. isn't it? Yeah. They started this, this new thing with co-living where you've, you've got your own pods or your own rooms, etc. But yeah. you've got your shops, you, you can work at desks. You've got your own business, but you've got other individuals with their own business and doing the same kind of room. thing. I've so seen that. A, a friend of mine has got a site, God knows, I can't remember where it is, like Outing mm-hmm. or something like that, so a little bit further north. And it's kind of like, um, like, a, like you know, a little radar thing that comes out like this that circles off. So it's a really weird looking site, and it kind of like just drops down off a cliff, and you've got like a reservoir and all these other things. And he's thinking that instead of putting all like a whole load of flats or something like that, He's going to build an actual community, not like one of those lovey-dovey hippie things where they start killing themselves, <laughs> but like a nice little kind of community where he can have the shops and the thing, and it's all in the same place. And I really think that's a really interesting idea. But I like creating the hubs where people can be. Can I, I can only add is the superstores. You know the big, big names. They are kind of working on those kind of strategies, so because they have the, the retail going well, but due to the market reset, everything they're building block of uh, flats on the top of their stores. Yeah. The idea is exactly the same. Well, they're not actually, th- bear in mind, it's th- not those stores that are doing those developments. The amount of Tesco, Sainsbury's, Waitrose, M&S that actually own the freeholds and the building, it's, it's, it's not a lot. It may be like one or two out of a hundred. And that, that's probably overselling the idea of it. It's the, the freeholder that owns that thinking, right, uh, Clearly, I'm not making the best use of this, so I'm going to start building on top. So the interesting thing that's happened is that you've got permitted development rights, so for commercial to residential, right? They're increasing permitted development rights, or if someone tells me the correct information, I think they're increasing the permitted development rights. And the one area that I'm interested in is that I think they're going to start doing um, um, airspace permitted yeah. development, right? Hasn't come in yet. They've been talking about September, October of this year, but there's nothing in set stone. But um, that will be the next thing that I look at because I still own quite a few freeholds. Um, and if there's any of them that's got flat roofs, I guarantee you by December of this year, if that comes in, they'll all have planning for an additional floor. Yeah. Right? Um, does anyone have any other questions or wants to pick apart any of the mad deals I've put across? Because I did come up with the more juicier ones. There are some ones that were really obscure, but I don't think anyone will find them that interesting. Hi there. Yeah, please share them. Um, I would, I would probably try not to be a, a cocky little shit um, <laughs> earlier, far, far sooner than, than I realised I probably shouldn't be a cocky little shit. Um, fortunately, um, I've done really very well um, in terms of, I like, even the ha- so where we live now, the flat that we bought is in Mill Hills. It's a nice part of Northwest London, and the wife is from there. I'm from Harrow, and we were getting married. She's like, oh, we've got to, got to find a place like so driving around we go into this little cul-de-sac and there's a poor old lady's being pulled out into in, in a in a, uh, in a in a gurney and put onto a thing and it's like is there anything we can do to help i'm nice guy i wanted to help and he goes no no don't worry mum's just going into a care and i said oh that's so sad it's you know i said my mum's passed away he goes oh, that's really sad started having a conversation i brought that flat off him three weeks later <laughs> really sad really really sad <laughs> but I, for a, for a two-bedroom 750 square foot flat in mill hill i paid two hundred thousand pounds so what I would do is I would do more direct to vendor. Um, what I would do is I would hit the auctions harder because I just took it all for granted. Um, what I would do is I'd underwrite things before I learned what underwriting was. I would take a massive, uh, this is in the book, I would take massive advantage of the underwriting um, option that most auction houses will provide, if you know what it is. Uh, I would have done that at least 10 years earlier, at least. I've only really been paying attention and trying to do positive things and build up a little bit. Expecting a baby, so the why has changed completely now. So uh, the baby's going to be here in October, so I kind of now need to create a little bit of legacy. Beforehand, there wasn't a legacy. It was just like, I like that car. <laughs> I need to make more money. So that was a really, really like luxurious position to be in, but it wasn't fruitful in any way. Uh, it took me a really long time to come out of some bad habits. Um, once I got over being cocky about things and actually started really bearing down on my due diligence and de-risking and realising the mistakes I made is because I was focusing on, on a fixed, either a fixed point in time or a fixed entry 
or a brick sketched it, I exit, I realised that that's where I was fucking up nine times out of ten. It was really, I was, it was all breaking down because I didn't put the advanced thought and the advanced processes in place to make sure that if A doesn't work, there's B. If B doesn't work, there's C. And at each one of these exits, I can walk away with profit. Or I can exit early with earlier exit strategies that you build into the process, as I was mentioning earlier. All you're doing is giving yourself every opportunity and every chance to succeed. If I would have come across that 10 years ago, uh, yeah, I, I'd, I'd have a nicer car. <laughs> I got a nice car, but a nicer car. Um, do you have any case study like uh, adding value to country homes, you know, like bungalows and all that, and uh, countryside, and I have, doubling them up? And I have one for a barn conversion that I did. And barn conversion, anyone? No? Yeah, please. Yeah, yeah. yeah uh, barn conversion. So um, the barn conversion was done not because a planning permission was easy, but there was a loophole in the planning. So what I had done was I had. Um, I knew someone, the wife is an inquestorate, so she does all the horsey things. She smells a lot of the time, but <laughs> she, she does all the horsey things. Um, and she was working at this one yard, and, and there was like, there's neighbouring yards in Hertfordshire, it's a very incestuous horsey environment there, uh, without any of the bestiality quotes. You know, so so she, she knew these people, and they're like, oh, you know, we want to really take the value of this building, but no, we don't want to go through the whole planning proce process. So I was like, okay, so what is it? He said, Oh, it's, it's, like a, it's like an 18th century barn. I said, well, you're not making your life easy, are you? He said, no, but we, we only use it to store like the hay in the winter. I was like, okay, well, let me have a look. And it turns out that if, if you know where to look within the UDP for a specific area, you may, in certain areas, find an exclusion for planning permission or full planning permission, an old version of, of permitted development, well, they call it permitted development, uh, on equestrian sites. So it wasn't the fact that it was a barn. Uh, the barns are difficult to do um, development on the best of times. But the fact that actually the process of getting the planning permission to do it was almost subverted by this old rule that I, probably the planners in place at the time didn't really know that much about. So I got them planning permission and I project managed the completion of the barn. And instead of selling the barn, they now live in it and they sold the farmhouse. Wow. But it, it was a beautiful barn. Beautiful barn. But that that was the only time where where, where I'd done something like that. The, there's a couple of people who do really good stuff when it comes to grade one and grade two listing or heritage. I think Joe and Jane Harling, they do a lot of commercial yeah. stuff. They're really very good at that. Uh, I've got some knowledge, but again, it's not something I would touch on a regular basis. It's my risk versus reward ratio. Um, the risk of being able to do something with limited knowledge outweighs the reward of doing the conversion. I stick to certain types of properties in certain areas and certain like fabrications because it enables me to de-risk the site and increase the potential value. So it's a case of just playing to your strengths really, um, but just being really considered in the whole process. Well, I think, I don't know about everybody here, but that was a really inspiring and insightful talk from Jay. Without yeah. his slides, Without the slides which first made time. it quite a lot tougher to do on how Jay buys, flips and trades property, making pretty huge sums of cash in some of those examples as well. Yeah. Now Jay's said he'll give me the slides to send out to you all, so you, you can go. have a... a can't speak, can't lie. There you go. <laughs> Before I forget. Before you forget. So I'll get a copy of that over to everybody on email, so you can have a copy of it. But that was pretty brilliant, Jay. Yeah, thank you very much.